So open API and, and APIs in general is the name of the game. And, and uh, we at Ostang uh, basically joined open API initiative recently. So it's the, the organization um, where there are a lot of API vendors and other interesting companies. And, and the goal is to basically standardize the open or keep the standard ongoing with open API specification and that's a pretty interesting job because there are so many kind of minds and stakeholders and everything in in the soup and and, and there are quite high-flying discussions um, on on the topics of which issues should be kind of settled and, and which which uh, features should be taken into account so uh, in case you you or somebody you know doesn't know what open api is there has been now some new documentation coming in so from open api initiative um there's this link here that goes to a github repo where there's a new guideline of or guide getting started guide uh that is pretty decent and and good we're still working on it uh, but but um Harvey who made the documentation was doing pretty good job and uh, I have uh, helped in the effort by making this kind of nice looking and, and pretty version of it and, and doing some of, of content organization on it but uh, the, the kind of content stuff is still a bit ongoing uh, and it will be published together with the release candidate 3.1.0 I uh, um, under that assumption. So these are these are pretty good news things and also one of the problems that has been there has been that open API as a specification has not been known enough so uh, there has been now this um, for this autumn this kind of office hours on Fridays with Kin Lane and we we have a, an interesting group there <laughs> that we have been discussing a lot about how what are the kind of issues around open api why are the uh, specifications not being used by some vendors or why they are kind of why they are still sticking to the swagger uh, name or, or what is the difference between swagger and open api this kind of basic stuff but also what are the versioning problems and 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 version change problems with tooling vendors but also then design of APIs and using open API there and of course then there are some other uh, questions coming in like what's the difference like can can open API be used with GraphQL or what is the kind of status with RAML, um, open API, GraphQL, async API and a lot of others. So we actually have this questions repo here in the uh, API specification toolbox and, and it's it's also covering now more than just open API. So there's RAML stuff and there's some other stuff there, async API stuff. And we have started to collect questions in that repo. There's a questions repo in, in that uh, place. And, and what the goal is, is that we could uh, start answering the questions. There are some answers already mostly provided by me and Kin, and then uh, there, are, there are short videos or some other format of, of answers but the idea is that others could contribute to those questions and answers there and that there could be like more and more than one answer and also the idea is to kind of collect them possibly as an FAQ to the uh, documentation site or next to it in, in some way that remains to yet be discussed and if somebody doesn't yet know why they should be doing specs or, or using specifications then we we recorded this um video with kin uh that can be found in the specification toolbox side on this link so i urge people to go. and there's also a, a nice interview with with async api founder fran so um I, I recommend going there. Okay, so what's the status with Open API 3.0 or 1.0? So it's still in release candidate, but there the kind of master repo of the final version have been has been started already. 
and uh, most of the issues or most of the, the commits that are coming into the 3.1.0 are already collected to that master uh, branch there but but there are still some issues to settle but the idea of the 3.1.0 was to um, include some important things like how to describe webhooks you know, this kind of subscription based webhook um, handling that is a, an important part of, of uh, push versus pull paradigm so that's pretty good and then identifying api licenses which is an, a really important and interesting topic considering kind of what is the li licensing model um, of apis in general it, it, it's not a very simple issue and then some things like for example raml had already originally some good stuff in it so it had this reusability and and kind of the, the um, components were reusable you could reuse stuff by um, reusing the request and response uh, samples and schema and there was in general support for schema and schema validation and and now there's that same stuff coming into open api which is pretty good there are also some security things coming in so for example client certificates and, and and some other things which are of course also important improvements um so the release candidate notes were written in june and they can be found uh from on the specification github repo in this link and then uh there's also a blog post in the open apis org blog about what's coming in and if you look at the blog there <laughs> there's also some obvious things that need improvement so the whole kind of how how things are communicated and marketed is a constant issue so that people would actually know what's happening because it's important uh, i think to understand that uh, the uh, knowledge of tool vendors for example api management vendors and some some other tooling vendors is not always totally up to date in terms of what is the difference between open api 2.0 and uh, which is kind of the current uh de facto standard if, if you're doing any open api stuff you're most likely doing open api 2.0 and most tools support that if they support any open api stuff but why uh should anyone kind of move over to from 2.0 to 3.0 in the first place so the idea there was that it's more like RAML, it's more uh, supporting productization of APIs. Um, and the idea was that, that there's this kind of more bit, better JSON schema support coming in and now it's coming in 3.1.0. Um, so yes, I would, I would definitely consider using open API 3, some things. Um, the problem is just that open api 3.0 was developed in, in kind of batch releases so there was like open api 3.0.3 and that sort of stuff so that kind of messed up a, a few things that people were confused that they thought that okay they are now using 3.0 but actually it was still missing some of the features supported in 2.0 so for example file up upload support came a bit late and it was completely different than in 2.0 and then some uh, tools were not supporting that yet when the the spec had been around or that, that version had been around like three to four months it came a bit later so it's it's important to make sure that whatever tooling you are using is supporting the version that you're using and, and now that we have this 3.1.0 coming in about maybe in in uh, inside a month or something so if i if i would need to guess it might be of course longer so uh it might take a while i would say late in this in in spring or something like that for most of the kind of biggest supporters to support it really in their tools 
so that's that's one thing um and then of course there's the what's next kind of there are of course a lot of um these issues and and, and feature requests already but there's there has been a lot of discussion for example lately that uh, there were questions just from last week. I, I just put the dates there because it was actually interesting that all of these came last week. So is open API suitable for describing GraphQL services? Uh, that was discussed on Friday uh, during the office hours. And, and that was actually an interesting thing because GraphQL, if you try to describe it with JSON schema and, and therefore open API uh, using JSON schema, it's actually, or JSON in general, it's actually really, really kind of huge. So it's kind of like you're describing a, a, a whole database in an open API, and it's not may, maybe the best idea. Um, so maybe if you need to describe GraphQL with open API, for, for example, to publish it in an open uh, or API management tool or something like that, it would make sense to treat it more in an RPC way which is supported by open api so kind of just saying that this is the main main endpoint graphql endpoint and then um uh dealing with the the other other parts of the documentation with the graphql specific tooling then also this kind of now that the json schema is coming in um a lot of folks using, for example, RAML, or used to using RAML, for example, are already kind of used to having the JSON schema and the samples in line uh, in the documentation or in the tooling, uh, and not with this kind of ref link or, or something that you have to kind of follow, you have to find in the documentation. And, and Open API 3.0 or 1.0 is now using that ref way of referencing the schema and that might not be kind of easiest for certain usability issues but on the other hand then uh, it's also not usable for reusing the schema for other tooling and for example uh, kind of testing a real-time validation and stuff so that's an interesting thing that might evolve somehow so then the kind of core point of API is a product so even though API, uh, open API 3 slash something was already kind of supporting more that productization layer for APIs and there seems to be more and more stuff coming in. So this was actually discussed last week uh, on Friday in the European Commission and API this Helsinki event that should the open API actually include uh, more product information. So kind of productization information like so some of the uh, API management vendors have this kind of some kind of plan or product uh, layer as a as a YAML or JSON file on top of the actual open API specification and it describes all the plans and rate limits and things like that for various users and that's something interesting that might be might be either good or might be an interesting addition to open API and, and that will probably be discussed further. And I would be interested to know if, if anybody has any kind of other uh, questions in mind related to this, uh, what should be next and what, what's coming next or specific use cases. Uh, I know that there has been a lot of discussion with, with like async API and, and BRPC and RPC and all that support for open API and it actually supports quite well, for example, RPC style of APIs. But that's kind of almost the end of what I had to say. So uh, what I think would be kind of cool from my personal point of view and my interest is that, and, and the group, group interest is that uh, we have the API cycles method and there has been now some discussion in the Slack, uh, in the API of Slack about if and how should the API of cycles um, support more uh, GraphQL or, or, or for example, 
async API style APIs. And actually it, it does support them quite well. It also supports a lot of open API things. So um, for open API, the audit checklist already is uh, kind of open API compatible or spec, any spec compatible and the canvas and, and minimum variable API architecture kind of is technology ag agnostic. The only thing that I have identified as a problem is the or potential problem or, or something to be uh, a bit and redesigned is, is the REST API style guide. So that might, that might need some work. But any ideas or questions or anything come to mind about open API specs in general, open API 3.1.0 in, in particular? I know that, um, yeah, tell me. Hello, Maria. Maria. Well, is when uh, respect, uh, how and the way that uh, Open API 3.3.10 affects your the API lifecycle? Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah. API lifecycle? No. API, yes. API up cycles. <laughs> I, API yeah. of cycle. And um, when do you think when do you think that you are going to have the new style guide of uh, REST to well, adapt actually, to, uh, to Open API? Well, actually, it's kind of like um, I I have right now uh, an ongoing project with a customer of my own that I might I I, I need to redesign there or give them a, mm -hmm. a, an API governance model and, and style guide and. Uh, I that that particular project is not done in English, but I still think that it could be one th where where we, I could look into um, kind of from from that point of view that what should be edited uh, because they are anyway using Open API in that project, and also it it is that kind of company or organization that they might not see it as a problem to even publish the results of that project in some way, uh, but at least mm -hmm. to take kind of the lessons to learn and, and discuss them maybe in the in the Slack or maybe in in some next if meetups. You are, if, you are going to, if you plan to share the with the uh, share your impression about that in Slack, I would like yeah. to participate and yeah and have uh, and help you if we need you need to it would to... be really good it would be really good because yes, we it's like to, that, to work yeah. on that too yeah because i know that there's a lot of like <laughs> we, we can see the traffic uh to that mm. page in the api cycles method and there are seriously serious organizations kind of looking into that and, and looking it, it over and, mm. and it's something that i know hasn't been touched in a while so it, it there needs to be something done anyway probably and and definitely from this open api point of view so it would be really good to have any any community effort uh, yes, to that because I we have a sure few we have a few uh, recommendations related with uh, apis and we yeah. make a like a a checklist too for us and and we are going is more our checklist is more related with open up api than api rest in general so yeah but you that's can share exactly, this with you. yeah i i don't know if you have seen the api audit checklist in the apop cycles method but that checklist is definitely it, it's agnostic <laughs> so uh -huh. it, it's kind of like uh of us uh stuff but also general design stuff like you know status codes and 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 a lot of other things and also if you are using specs uh, at all or or any standard for the specs and things like that so there's about i guess 30 or something and there's a video about that too how to how mm -hmm. to use that so that has been something that companies or people and developers have been finding useful because there has been a problem like like in general the, the problem is that when you have a new developer or a developer that is new to the team. Yes. So how do you make sure that they kind of yes. follow the back practices? 
that is uh, we use uh, even that for like a white book, a yeah. white book of, uh, of rules that the people should uh, implement in their API before to share with us. So yeah, yeah, something and, and that that uh, I have always kind of seen it so that no matter if if you're not using anything else out of API cycles method the audit checklist is something that you sure. should definitely <laughs> kind of use and, and maybe adopt to yourself. But uh, mm -hmm. that's that's kind of the one thing. And then, of course, if you are using any kind of audit checklist, then um, the style guide kind of has to be there because then you have to have something that says that, okay, uh, here's the kind of checklist requirement that you should have this like this, but then kind of more that, this is done or this is designed in our case like this or we have to take uh, into con consideration these things and originally why the the api of style guide api of cycle style guide was born was that and why why it's like that um it was because there was no b2b kind of or kind of an uh, serious organization using serious APIs design guide. So mm -hmm. a lot of the kind of guides or some blogs or something that were out there at the time were uh, a few years back, they were kind of from very, very lightweight APIs for, for stuff that didn't need a lot of kind of heavy lifting or authentications or uh, for example, localization support or mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that kind of stuff or the, the security mm -hmm. requirements and uh, for example were not that much so there wasn't a style guide or anything like that at the time and I, I'm not sure if there still is because a lot of a lot of people are referring to that so but that would be interesting to kind of both the audit audit um, checklist and the style guide to be kind of looked through from this point of view together so I will, I will remember that. Anything else? I started to think that yes. probably also addition of webhooks means that audit uh, requirements grow. It will be yeah. a different use scenario calls going in a different direction. Yeah. Uh, in some senses, yes. What we found was there's already like because webhooks were already or REST hooks or whatever you prefer, but they were already considered when doing API of cycles. And so, from a design point of view, of course, there are some differences, but there's also kind of um, the status codes and and authentication stuff that you should follow. And it's like not maybe so specifically stated there, but I'm, I'm glad that it's now coming to open API because that then raises the point of, of describing it in a particular way, <laughs> also in the yes. style guide and in the audit uh, checklist. So, uh, because what, what we followed right now, uh, or, or when, when it was done was that the principles stated in the resthooks.org by Zapier. So, they were kind of wanting to stop the polling madness some years ago already. And, and that has been some, how, how uh, I have implemented uh, the kind of subscription hooks in, in a lot of different API cases. So that was kind of the, the way. And I think that this is the kind of basic principle behind the, um, the, the features now in open API, but they definitely need a little bit more look through and, and also making sure that it's supported in, in the API of cycles. And there has been a lot of uh, questions also to support async API by API of cycles. So to check what needs to be done, if anything, to kind of make sure that that's there. It's basically the style guide and the audit checklist are the only techno somewhat technology specific and the style guide is definitely more or most technology specific things in the in the method. Okay. Anything else or should we just go towards observability? 
I wonder whether there will be some quality measurements like SLA for APIs um, in standard form, because there are P99, P50, uh, P95. Uh, that's exactly, uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly so that's, the kind of productization layer. So that, that's exactly kind of part of the discussion that, that was kind of started in, in the um, European Commission API Days uh, workshops because there, it, it's kind of an interesting question because especially in the public sector, there has been a lot of APIs that don't have any kind of service yeah. level agreements, even, even theoretically. <laughs> and, yeah. and then of course, <laughs> uh, in order for, for them to describe them and in order for like uh, lots of improvements in general discoverability and, and tooling, it would be really cool to have that sort of stuff. Yeah, because sort of in, in health, healthcare sector, for instance, there is a lot of uh, applications that they need the response uh, in, in certain time. Otherwise, it will uh, impact yeah, on the patient and, and health or, or, or the diagnosis, for instance. Course, so and, and in those, that, that's why it would be great if, yeah, if there would yeah. be an actual SLA format standard um, yeah, instead of, of you course, know, that everybody is doing something yeah. there themselves. It should, of course, all, always be agreed on, and, and of course, a lot of times it's just forgotten. But but it's uh, a question of also kind of in most cases, critical systems do have that SLA, and, and but when we are talking, but about I haven't seen it in APIs, and that's really really yeah, ridiculous. I, I have seen it in server side. I have seen seen it, seen it in uh, networking. Yeah. I have seen it in. Uh, OS in, in networking. I know, I know. Um, and, and that's kind of also, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, that's also why in APL cycles originally I put there that uh, business impact canvas and, and the whole discussion about like what if the API becomes un unavailable and what if it comes uh, unavailable like for one minute or one hour or yeah. you know one day who dies? That's usually when I train yes. it. I ask like does somebody yeah. die if your API is not working yeah. for this if, period If you of think time? about cars yeah. uh, that are actually uh, using APIs to do recognition in, mm -hmm. in traffic. So if you think about autonomous vehicles and such, and there yeah. will be something like this, that the API uh, goes down or something. So what is the impact on that? Yeah, and yeah. there I will uh, bring the compliance part because there is no, I didn't find it because no, I, I, mean, I tried to find yeah, it for exactly. the day because uh, the, this was about API compliance as well yeah. and uh, observing the compliance. And I was like, oh my God, there is none. Yeah, but you can't. Yeah, and, and that was exactly what we discussed with Maria, for example, on Monday about that kind of, if you have a, an autonomous car situation and, and you use, for example, that computer vision API, yes. <laughs> which is supposed <laughs> to detect the traffic lights and, and it gives you a response time of like, you know, best effort or... Yeah. Or be, even like 10 seconds yeah. or two seconds might be too long for that. Yeah, case, be, so. because it uh, might not be the case that it would be only the API mm -hmm. that is, is uh, broken, but the whole chain. Yeah. Because yeah. there are there can be uh, more than one. So yeah. API, so it, there is front end APIs and back end. Yeah. But APIs. even from the same system and, or even from the same cloud, for example, there are definitely different SLA and, and, and different compliance requirements for the different APIs because they might serve totally different purposes. And for example, the data uh, lifecycle or, or how ref refresh is fresh question uh, about data that the APIs provide, for example, it, it, it varies. Even in this, inside the kind of same use case, uh, depending on which part the API is handling, there, there are differences. But this is a good kind of uh, bridge to the <laughs> topic of compliance and observability and, and I think that we should move over to that discussion and, and why TESSA is here and why TESSA is going to demo Hypertrace which is an open source uh, first ever open source observability platform is that um, I, I was contacted <laughs> during the summer by, by an old API uh, kind of relation uh, from, from Traceable 
uh, Tyler Reynolds, and, and he, uh, he was telling that, hey, we are doing this super cool thing, and it's kind of coming out of the, 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 the box right now, and we are coming out of stealth mode, and it would be super cool to do something around it. And, and then Tessa and, and I had a talk, and we were like, oh, yes, Tyler, yes, we want, want yes. to have that talk. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw, we saw a demo uh, of it and, and of their kind of commercial product, but also then the Hypertrace. And then it was just releasing the Hypertrace as open source code at the time and it was having a few you know children's diseases, diseases yeah. and stuff and, and Tessa was was um, giving some valuable feedback and we have been kind of innovating a little bit with them of, of what should be done and what could be done and now we are at the stage where <laughs> Tessa <Yeah. laughs> is able to demo it um, and, and show what you can do and, and Tessa if you can start with telling uh, what does this observability in general mean and what is the whole thing that you can do? Yeah, if you can give me the screen sharing so I can yes, share I the... Put you as yeah. a, yes, let me check here. Now you have all the rights. Yes. And uh, I will this one. So, can you see my screen? Yes. So basically I was thinking that I will, uh, I didn't do the um, slide deck because I think that this site is quite cool. <laughs> and um, uh, Hypertrace is open source platform and then it's uh, based on Apache 2.0 license, which is really, really important when you, you know, use open source um, software that you uh, check on the legal basis and, and the risks on the licenses. So uh, Apache uh, 2.0 is, is in a um, low, low risk <laughs> license. So, so it's, it's pretty cool in, in that way. And um, traceable guys, uh, they are really, really uh, competent people <laughs> on, on uh, APIs and, and actually ingesting data in the chest and data um, handling, so to say, and the processes as well. So what they had built, I didn't even realize how, how great it, it, it was before we actually got to see the demo and all the user scenarios that can be Done, done by using um, a hypertrace. So basically uh, what you can do is you can make each microservice transactions um, traceable. Um, you need to, of course, put the URIs in place in your um, endpoints and such. Uh, but then when you have done that, uh, you can monitor the whole uh, chain of, of what, what is happening in, in that API. And currently I'm running my uh, demo in, in Azure. Um, I also had it in Kubernetes services, in ABS, it goes to Google, and there is no platform type of uh, uh, problematics uh, when, you, when you implement the development version of it. Um, of course, Windows uh, servers itself, there, there were uh, <laughs> little bit issues because um, some of the software are running bash. So, you know, you need, uh, in order to have shell, uh, you need to have ESL in, in uh, Windows and, and that was a little bit tricky, but we resolved that issue as well. So, so it's, it's basically fixed now. Um, what you, can do also is that um, when you have uh, built a trace, you can monitor what happens inside it. You can uh, identify the dependencies. So when I was talking about the compliance and we are talking about uh, compliance audit trail, so it, it, it doesn't help anything that you only need know that what is happening inside one API. That, that's, um, that's basically what most of the monitoring tools does. They don't do the whole audit trail. That's how the chain of APIs are working together. And this was something that I was like, okay, this is cool guys. <laughs> and um, then 
of course, when we were discussing about compliance and quality, so they were like, okay, we have this performance, uh, how we can see how these APIs are performing as well. So that's, that's pretty cool as well, because you can see and find the root cause of, of some issues on whether the SLA compliance or other compliance are met, uh, depending on the standards, of course. Uh, then, of course, when you have all this information available, you can optimize the, your application and your service performance. So it, it's pretty cool. Uh, how it's done, it's based on Kafka. I don't know uh, if you are aware how Kafka works. Uh, they have, there are producers and then there are consumers. So basically Hypertrace OC collector is the one you actually put into your microservice or your um, uh, application in order to get that endpoint uh, data to Kafka. Um, then Span Normalizer is basically normalizing the basic uh, raw data. Uh, it's it's a kind of a topic. Uh, Kafka, you can, in, inside Kafka, you can create the topic. So it, it's basically uh, doing a little bit uh, adjustment for the data and then normalizes it it's for further use. So the second, uh, second topic is uh, raw spans grouper, which is basically, um, grouping the normalized spans of raw data. And then uh, for hypertrace trace in richer, uh, it basically creates uh, uh, these uh, traces for you to view in hypertrace view and to be not is, is compiling the, all that together. And um, can you, actually see my uh, Kafka screen now because I can't actually see what I'm sharing. Yes, um, yes we can see good. <laughs> your, uh, the hypertrace documentation with the Kafka picture there. Yes. yes. So I'm, I'm not going through all of this uh, material and such, all of the details because those are in, in training, uh, deep, deep dive uh, training sessions where we are actually diving deep into each of the um, services and how, how they are functioning. And also, of course, implement uh, some of the uh, some of the uh, things that I have created here in demo. Um, in this demo, I actually have done really, really basic stuff. So basically, I didn't start to take any posts. I only focused on focused on on gets uh, because the simplified. Uh, information, it is much, much more easier to explain what is happening. And then when we go in deep digestions in, in um, uh, courses and trainings, there we have actually uh, more, more detailed information because we have uh, limited time. So basically that's why, why I only, only use the, the one get request here. So basically, the thing is that how we ingest the real-time data is that I have websites um, which actually prints um, prints uh, a date, and then uh, we ingest that data when when the user goes and and wants to print the or to get the date from the site, and it sends it to API uh, backend, and then we get. Uh, all the trace information and such, which are which are run through uh, Kafka, and uh, so now we have that issue. It's there. I need to move a little bit. This. Um, so. So now you should see uh, see one of my um, screens, and let's go to the dashboard. So do you see uh, Hypertrace dashboard? Yes. So I will take last two hours because I have been, you know, getting a lot of uh, date prints <laughs> from the site. <laughs> 
So uh, what does Port does? It, it provides the information of uh, latency, everything that is bigger than 15, uh, one second, sorry, one second. And latency which are higher than 500 milliseconds and also the errors. P99 is one of the SLAs that we were actually talking about uh, together with Mariukka. And P99 means that um, this, this uh, latency that you can see here is the 1% and it's the worst case. And in P50, the same amount for 50%. And then there is calls per second as well, how many seconds. So basically what you can do with this data is that you can actually see that, okay, what is the threshold? What, what should be the threshold on your API, APIs uh, when, you, when you look at the dashboard? Top assets here is, are the gets. So we have had a lot of uh, get requests and um, we can dig deep into, into the gets as well. If I would have here gets and posts and other, uh, other information, um, other requests, uh, I could actually go and see, and, and see the dependencies here as well for, for those requests. In application flow, you can actually see and you can move around. It depends uh, what is your complexity on, on different uh, scenario. For instance, if I would have here uh, more complex, not only this get request, I would have uh, much more uh, components here to, to look at and, and the dependencies as well. So basically I can see what is the, um, latency between these two elements. If I would have uh, additional um, flows, I could see the whole de dependencies and I could calculate like, okay, this is not going well. Uh, if I think about the whole chain of, of what service this front end for, for instance would provide um, and, and could see the whole chain of, of uh, the requests before uh, the client gets the actual uh, uh, actual data that it has requested, uh, then you can actually say that, okay, this is not fine. Uh, even though the first point could show uh, that it, it's, it's uh, in quality wise, it is great. But if you see the whole chain, whole dependency chain, uh, it can be so that you actually have a bigger issue. For instance, this kind of dependency mapping we did um, in, in uh, operator where I was working, we had these mobile subscriptions and uh, mobile subscriptions were connected to uh, this kind of uh, PBX phone systems. And when these phones, somebody called inside to the phone system, the delay was uh, in that node first, then it started to go to a uh, fixed network, then there, it go, went to mobile network before it reached the actual mobile and connected to call, it was too late. It was, the call was cut from, from the uh, main node because the time uh, milliseconds were um, overreach. So that's why it's really important also with APIs that you can actually see uh, the whole, uh, latency uh, as a, your product service, not only one API or such, but the overall service of what, you are, what your APIs are providing. Because for instance, if you sell API and it's, it's connected to other uh, APIs or, or the software is connected to other APIs, um, then you will probably will have an issue because the customers probably or the developers will turn to some other uh, company for, for the service because um, 
your quality is not where it should be. So this is really, really great way to find out what is the actual quality of your uh, quality of your uh, APIs and also the dependencies. So you can see the whole app application flow here. Um, you can actually go straight through and, and dig through to the service and see what is going on here in, in detail. So when you can, you know, click deeper, dive deeper in the data. So it's, it's really great that you can actually follow the path, follow the APIs and actually find the actual issues, issues from here, from, from your data. Um, you can see the health and how you can see it. It's, um, you can see the prior hour, prior day, prior week, prior month. But you can also uh, have custom data last 15 minutes. It, it depends how you, how you want to uh, visualize your data. And this is really good that you, you have uh, shorter, shorter, shorter periods and you can also do custom. So in custom, you can actually select the date. For instance, if, you, if your customer complains that, okay, now I have this and this kind of issues with your service and um, uh, I don't know, it was pr probably at uh, 12 o'clock or one o'clock. So you can actually uh, take the time range and look whether you uh, find any anomalies from, from the uh, data from here. So it, it, uh, that you can actually fix, fix the issues uh, with your, with your um, APIs and also the, with the dependencies. Then when we can see here um, to API endpoints, uh, here it is the actual endpoint for get API, we can see how many calls we have had, and we can see the latencies between front and back end. Uh, it's uh, 17 milli, 17.5 milliseconds here. And when you go to traces, um, you can actually see what kind of get it has been, what, what was the method. It could be post as well. As I told uh, in prior, I only have get, get in, in this uh, demo because it would have been more complex to explain in this time uh, all the post, post because there is also in, in post, there are so many security issues. Um, so um, that's why it's, it's important that uh, I try to keep it simple. So we have a HTTP method. This is uh, something that you can't actually push to any uh, website URL. It's it's um, HTTP frame, how it actually works. The path, uh, the service name for Jager here, uh, which is a uh, backend. And also we can see that this is the actual control method the, uh, but that you sh you will print the date. So printing the date was like, this was really, really simple. Uh, so basically when I push here, it, it's basically prints the date and, and uh, this website or the service has actually um, URL for Hypertrace connect collector. And then it tells uh, what was the span kind and how much time how much time the whole du duration uh, took. Backends, I don't have any in this one. But then when we go to Explorer, we can actually see more data on, on uh, about the endpoint trace. So we can sort it uh, through calls, duration, end time, boundary types, which I have here, you know, in services backend. 
and then you can actually see and you can actually also um, filter the calls using rate limits minimum minimums or such and you can actually add different filters here so basically you can add filters like duration and time boundary types discover stage endpoint ids which is really important if customer says that okay i i tried this and i came from here so you can if you have traceable uh, traceable in in that endpoint then you can actually uh, use the identifier which is a unique name for for that endpoint um, you can use endpoint names as well or even trace trace id but then it also only shows the uh, trace. You can uh, filter through using error count. So basically if you have had some known issue or such, so you can uh, basically search for new errors and, and see whether there is error counts for, for that topic. HTTP method, it can be the print or uh, what, what you actually that so you can also select a different a different way of, of visualizing the data so basically here you can filter filter the data as, as you wish if, if you think about the quality perspective um, maybe the most important metrics is, is the calls, uh, because usually if you have um, multiple users using uh, the APIs, usually uh, the, that's the scenario where you probably will start to have issues. But if you have some fundamental issues with your APIs, um, then you can actually see them in error count better, but but with the, if, if you think about uh, the amount of uh, users, then you can see that, okay, maybe you should include more capacity or, or such. Yes, so are we yeah. able to already t start taking questions, <laughs> looking at the time? And I would actually have one oh, yeah. kind of comment yeah. for this. So exactly the, the kind of, for example, the status code and filtering with the status code and looking at the front end and back end, that's super important because uh, I remember like this legendary case where, which we had with a big retail uh, online store and, and, and it was really, really uh, weird when we were doing the first pilot testing before, just before going to kind of full scale marketing mode with it. And we saw this mysterious 500 status codes coming from some of the requests and we couldn't figure out what was happening. That was the only thing that we saw from API management that uh, some, some calls that just failed. And if we could have seen the front end and the back end at the same time at the same system, it would have been clear to us from the first go that there were some cookies <laughs> going yeah. <laughs> into the API request and messing them about and the back end just clearly refused some of these cookies but we couldn't get to that kind of situation without seeing the full traffic and of course yeah. with these microservices and, and the whole distributed situation that companies are right now having with the APIs and back ends and front ends and everything so I think this is very important but I think that if we have any questions from anybody, then please let's get to yeah. those now. So any, any idea right now, <laughs> what is <Yeah>. observability? <laughs> what could you do yeah. with the runtime tool? Is this yeah. any better than your current tools in any way? Just a question uh, yeah. about uh, how to manage the data that you get from this platform. Uh, the, the database is uh, almost deployed with the rest of Hypertrace. It's part of the infrastructure or you are using a database 
outside of the platform? Uh, then you actually uh, implement that to the endpoint, actually, the, the IP address of, of that. Uh, so you need to uh, put the collector also uh, to the back end. Okay, so... Uh, so it's, it's like, a, it's, it's not like an agent, it's, it's more of a like... A, um, Yes, a proxy that yeah. give, uh, every every request that go to the microservices and you uh, that get uh, the information and bring back to the Kafka and so so. Yeah. But uh, the how how we can manage the amount of data that is going is going to to hypertrace for a long time. So the the solution is uh, is. Uh, Sometimes these kind of solutions don't only bring information for a short amount of time because the amount of data that they collect are so huge. So yeah. in this case, there are different backends or you can um, de deploy this solution on uh, Oracle database or MySQL or any other yeah. kind of just yeah, or um, yeah, you actually can. You you can basically um, one thing is is you know make it scalable and elastic is is to run it using ah, uh, Kubernetes. On, on elastic. Yeah. So basically, okay. what what I have uh, done now, I have tested it uh, using uh, AKS in Azure Kubernetes service okay. and and backends. Also, um, Amazon Web Services uh, we have tested as well, and. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, okay. I think I, I think uh, that works uh, best. Of course, you can work with um, additional services as well. But I don't the scalability. Uh, yeah, it, it can be reads, but it's of course more complex to build uh, in in infrastructure side. Um, yes. Yeah. And just la last question is. Uh, about um, a part trace is only focuses focuses on observa observa observability. Just it, there is not any interaction with microservices uh, at the same at the level to decide the versions or to make a, a routing from different service to different services or just only observability. This is only for observability because I think Traceable has uh, a deeper service for security and such, uh, and, and it's the priority. But it, it has, of course, API, so you can build something um, using using uh, the Hypertrace platform. And so, if you would would want to like do a, a runtime hyperscaling thing where it could automatically route traffic. Uh, depending on what's going wrong there, if I if I kind of got the idea correctly. Yeah, so, uh, yeah and of sure. course, if you have monitoring system where you you know have alerts and such, so you can in implement that uh, to the next and and basically post the post the data to to monitoring APIs, so you can get it to Nakios and or whatever monitoring system you are using. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, there are a lot of possibilities. So this is a data ingestion and, and observability platform. So basically, you can distribute the data and, and to crunch data forward as well. There has been some discussion on, on kind of uh, should they or should they not uh, extend, for example, to kind of compliance and, and uh, for example, yeah. like if you would want to, from an API perspective, if you would want to extend your use cases so that like you, you would want to look at how compliant your API really is on runtime, for example, with your open API specification. Yeah. So <clears throat> that has been something that has been discussed and there actually are tools already, some of them even open source tools um, or, or partly open source for that particular thing. And, and there has been discussion 
for example, with the Dave, the, the hypercrisis community manager, that if these could be like, if they should build it themselves or if, if they could kind of use these ready-made tools and platforms to have that um, feature there. And of course, uh, well, I suggested on Friday that they should be looking into this as a kind of plug-in infrastructure. So there yeah. could be a lot of different tools that could have like plugins with Hypertrace or Hypertrace could use them as plugins. Yeah, because for instance, you actually can get a lot of information on basically from HTTP how packages uh, <laughs> and methods and such. Um, but that's something that traceability is, is doing, uh, for instance, you know, in, in security side that they have done this, um, they actually can not see whether personal information breach is happening or, or almost happening. So they, they can actually block it and, and they have done a lot of stuff uh, next to the hyper trace. So, yeah, there's that AI at the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right there is AI, AI, yeah. And yeah, this is just data uh, collecting and, and ingestion and a little bit data crunching um, for for the messages and uh, methods. So, but it's it's really great for, because I don't, I don't think that these kind of systems, I don't know, Mariuka, if you have seen any similar Oh, that I'm, actually is, is as elastic as this one because this goes yeah uh, not not so elastic and not definitely looking at the, the different components but there of course there during this summer this summer has been suddenly a uh, summer of observa observability <laughs> yeah <laughs> a lot of the, the vendors of all kinds of commercial uh, clouds and 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 for example api management pros and other things have suddenly come up with their own observability tools so obviously this is not the only one, or traceable is not the only one, but they are quite far in the security um, side on the observability and hypertrace being open source. Yes. Of course, and it's, that's it's a huge thing. So uh, yeah. the other efforts that we've seen are, are most mostly um, commercial products and, and there have been some similar things going on for some time now, specifically on the security area. Uh, so, but this is kind of more agnostic. Yeah. What is being used. Yeah. And one thing, of course, that it's about to license. Usually I've seen a lot of uh, software with uh, GPL version 3, which is uh, something that Linus Tuwells also is, is not fan about because it's, it's uh, more restrictive um, legally. So that's... Um, one thing because uh, nobody wants to have viral uh, impact if they develop something next to this um, platform or such so that they don't want to you know lose the uh, licensing rights on on their products so it, it gives more flexibility on on that sense yep can you hear me yes. yeah so um i would have a question regarding the examples um, have yeah. you tested the example in GitHub? Yeah, there is actually a hyper phrase GitHub. And they have some kind of example application. Yes. I was wondering yes. if it would be um, like useful to also check a more complex example than what yeah, you've shown now. Yeah, I actually have more complex but as I said, it's, uh, yeah, it's 1829 already. So that's why I didn't take the actual um, sample application, which I actually have, uh, the, it's, it's this complex, uh, what I usually use. So uh, it's, it's the full, um, full uh, application, uh, payment gateways and such. But that's something that I use for trainings only. Yes. Yes, I think it yeah. will be interesting to <laughs> yeah. see it sometime. Yeah, yeah and then it's also, I, I keep it hands-on, so it's, it's we're in, in training, so we actually implement the whole thing. But this one was simple. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you. Yeah. Hey, guys, thank you for coming, and thank you, Tessa, for 
for taking us on a tour of observability that might have been quite new to quite a lot of people and let's uh have a wrap so thanks yeah. for thanks for coming and thanks for for great questions and and uh actually we'll see in a, the next APOS meetup in october 13th so there will be a joint APOS meetup with dallas APOS. oh nice Good. so we'll <laughs> go through uh, a little bit more about APOS cycles and and kind of why when how they they have collected this whole bunch of questions i'm i'm <laughs> exhausted already but maybe we will not be able to answer every single one and there will be probably a mass of others but um yeah looking forward to that and, and it's it's um interesting yeah. get up that we will have then but if you have any any needs for any trainings or stuff we we are having these trainings and this yeah. is yeah, and I, I keep it as hands-on trainings because it's it's um, much more easier to understand when you develop at the same time or do do at the same time. And also there was quite a, a, a learning curve. Uh, we were having having a lot of discussions with this and Tessa was having a lot of discussions with, with the Hypertrace team and of course it was well, early days. But, but it early was days. because of the windows, yeah. <laughs> because I, I took the hardest platform to implement it and I had a gaming platform uh, with Ryzen um, CPU and um, it, it didn't work with um, Hyper Wii very, very well. I actually get, got black screen and, and then I even though you know yeah. it, it was um, um this um compatibility issues with with uh, hyper v and ryzen uh yeah. processor so but oh, you can oh. imagine that we we go to bios and and uh um cpu level so it was pretty pretty <laughs> complex moral of, the, moral of the story only use serious computers <laughs> <laughs> with linux and no gaming <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the, the gaming computers are they they have power, they are, so they it's are. they are really good in development as well. So and and pretty expensive. <laughs> okay, but hey guys, thanks for this one, and let's see if we can get this recording out. Maybe. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. bye.